The Bearings Crisis of 1995 is regarded as one of the most infamous events of the banking world in recent times. Bearings, the UK's oldest and one of the most respected banks, was brought to its knees by the actions of a single trader, Nick Leeson. In Leeson's short yet marvellous career as Chief Derivatives Operations Manager in Singapore, he was attributed for losses of roughly $1.2 billion, 300,000 more than the bank's capital holdings. This led to the insolvency of the UK's oldest bank and its subsequent £1 sale to Dutch bank ING. Nick was hired by Bearings in 1989 where he excelled in a middle office role until he was appointed as general manager of a new operation in futures markets on the Singapore exchange. Leeson's role in Singapore was to exploit low risk, low risk arbitrage opportunities that would leverage price differences between similar derivatives on the Cymex and Osaka exchange. Instead of trading on low risk arbitrage opportunities, Leeson began taking much riskier positions by buying and selling different amounts of the contracts on the two exchanges or buying and selling contracts of different types. At first, these unauthorised speculative trades made large profits, roughly 10% of Bearing's net profits for 1992, but inevitably Leeson's luck began to run out. This prompted him to create the 5 8 account to hide his losses. He then instructed his members of staff to exclude it from all reports that they were required to make to their superiors. He then used this account to cover up all of his unauthorised bad trades. To conceal these activities, he made various false declarations and deliberately fake records, which went unnoticed by his superiors. By the end of 1992, the losses in the account amounted to 2 million. As Leeson became more desperate to make back what he had lost, he started taking increasingly riskier positions and by the end of 1994, losses in the account surged to 208 million. In a desperate attempt to claw back at his losses, Leeson placed a short straddle on the Singapore and Tokyo stock exchanges, essentially betting that these exchanges would remain stable. The very next morning disaster struck, the Kobe earthquake hit southern Japan, sending all Asian markets into freefall. In one final attempt to recoup his losses, Leeson placed an extremely leveraged long position on the Nikkei, betting that it would make a speedy recovery. This speedy recovery never occurred, and on the 23rd of February Leeson fled Singapore with his wife leaving a note in his office with the words, I'm sorry leaving Bearings with a total loss of $1.2 billion, twice that of the bank's trading capital. Three days later, after a failed bailout attempt, the UK's oldest bank was declared insolvent. In the weeks following the collapse of Bearings, it became abundantly clear that the UK's oldest bank were not prepared to detect and then deal with the fraud. The first major mistake made by the bank was to give him control of trading as well as the authority to settle his trades. The complete lack of direct oversight gave him the opportunity to create the 5 8 account through which he funneled his losses. In July 1994, the internal auditor of Bearings even highlighted the lack of internal controls and recommended that Leeson should be relieved of back office duties as it caused a conflict of interest nothing was done by senior management. Another mistake made by Bearings was that they should have second guessed how Nick's supposed risk averse trading was contributing to such a large portion of their annual profits. Alarms should have also been raised by the size of the margin calls that Leeson was requesting on a daily basis. This shows a lack of knowledge of derivatives by its senior managers and a big weakness in Bearings control procedures. Jerome Curviel is a former French trader who in 2008 was convicted of forgery, breach of trust and unauthorised use of computers by Société Générale, resulting in losses of about 4.9 billion euros, six times that of Nick Leeson. His losses of 4.9 billion is the largest single trading loss in banking history. Mr. Carviel joined Sockgen in the summer of 2000, working in a middle office role in its compliance department. In 2005, he was promoted to junior trader in Sockgen's Delta One products team, 
responsible for plain vanilla futures hedging on European equity market indices. In 2007, he started taking huge unauthorised directional positions beyond his limited authority, and by December 2010, he was actually in 1.4 billion euros profit. Aided by his in-depth knowledge of the control procedures resulting from his previous employment in the middle office, he managed to conceal these positions through a scheme of elaborate fictitious transactions. He had learned how to hack this risk surveillance system and was only fulfilling half of the arbitrage trade. By doing this, his net exposure stayed within set ranges and he remained out of the radar. The second blind spot Mr. Curviel took advantage of was the data relating to margin calls. Eurex only showed consolidated positions which were not unusual from volumes expected of large investment banks. This shows the importance of trades being attributable to each individual trader. By January 2008, Curviel had managed to build an unhedged 50 billion exposure to European futures markets, which amazingly was one and a half times the market cap of the bank. Curviel's fraud was detected on the 18th of January when a compliance officer discovered a trade that had... In 1995, when great trade financial institutions like Bearings had been brought to bankruptcy by a young trader, Nick Leeson. Though he was fully responsible for his fraudulent activities, it was clear that it is not right to blame it on was on just work of one trader. Not only this, at that time he won one chair of Singapore Futures Exchange goes public in her view that the collapse of Bearings was due more to the failure of its senior managers than to Nick Leeson himself alone. We cannot just blame this on Nick Leeson alone as the management was not in control of their operations in Singapore which led to this situation. So they are equally responsible for this. Even though Nick Leeson at Bearings never held a trading license prior to his arrival in Singapore, there was little oversight of his activities and no individual was directly responsible for monitoring his trade trading act strategies. Similarly, Curviel only became a junior trader in 2005 and had little trading experience when he began to build up his concealed positions in the three months of 2007. He also took advantage of the fact that his immediate supervisor had resigned and had not yet been replaced. The new direct manager, hired in April 2007, failed to carry out any detailed check of the earnings generated by his traders, including Jerome Carvial. Not only was this manager new and seemingly lacking the experience required to supervise several traders, he was also not giving enough support and guidance from higher level management on the Delta One trading team. However, even under the previous manager, Carvial was able to take un unauthorized trading intraday directional positions on index futures and equities. This is even more remarkable because unlike Leeson at Bearings, Carvial was working at the headquarters of a supposedly sophisticated financial institutions. In both the cases, it is clear that lack of monitoring of employees and lack of direct management oversight is the reason to blame banks. In 2011, Roach traders came back to headlight after UBS admitted that unauthorized trading by Kwiku Adaboli has cost the bank $2.3 billion. He created a secret under the desk account called Umbrella account, which he can dip in and out of so that people wouldn't know. He started to log bogus trades to make it look as if hedge has been made even it actually hadn't. So in summer of 2011 when his luck and market started to move against his bets, in few weeks his, tra his trades logged a losses of 2.3 billion dollars. He was actually doing this stuff which was completely wrong and illegal. The reason this happened was because having been left without a manager with the experience that he had so whenever he used to go to his manager with the problem that he faces at any time in brand new ETF and index based projects at that time. They were told that this is to be resolved by their own skills and strategies. 
In all of the three cases, they were all left alone to do experiments on their own without any supervision, which led them to take huge risks, which eventually turned them into roach traders.